Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. Okay, today on the channel, we are taking a look at the new version of Space Aces. And this is Space Aces Voyages in Infinite Space. So if you've been watching the channel for a while, you will recall that I am a huge, huge fan of the original Space Aces, the new guidebook. This is one of my favorite little solo RPG zines. I think this thing is just incredible. The game is designed by Stephen Hands, and Stephen Hands did send me this package for this video review. And you can still get all of this physical stuff on his Etsy shop. And I will post a link to that in the description below. But the original Space Aces, a new guidebook, was incredible. And I love this game. It's very simple, but it has enough meat to keep me interested. And it has a lot of different charts for rolling up random missions and scenarios and quests and monsters and space hulks to, to uh, explore in different types of spaceships and, and, and planets and enemies and weird creatures and all kinds of stuff. It is a game that is set in a science fiction Saturday morning cartoon universe. So think of things like, uh, I, I kind of compared it to a lot of classic 80s sci-fi anime like Crusher Joe or maybe even uh, Dirty Pair or some newer stuff like Cowboy Bebop, maybe meets uh, Dark Water, Pirates of Dark Waters with, uh, oh, I don't know, Star Blazers or something like that. You get the idea. Imagine all of those cartoons, all of those science fiction cartoons you grew up loving, and Space Aces is kind of set in that kind of world. So I do have a really detailed, uh, good video on Space Aces, the new guidebook that I did sometime last year so if you're if you are more interested in seeing how this original version works go check out that video when i heard that the designer he contacted me on on discord and when he told me he was working on a new version a big expanded version i was super super excited and i really couldn't wait to get my hands on it because i thought it would add a lot to the game and it does however when I first got the new version, and this will be the focus of the video today, Space Aces Voyages in Infinite Space, I was a little bit disappointed. And we will talk a little bit about why here at the beginning. So Space Aces, the new guidebook, it is a very simple system, but it does have some meat on its bone. It has kind of just enough crunch, I would say. So here is the character sheet for the original version. Your characters are very simple, but they do have some stats. So we have, I think, five stats. We have Moxie, Smarts, Wiggles, Friends, and Pockets. And then we also have a kind of a currency uh, stat, kind of. It's called Gumption. And that is kind of your character's ability to go on. It's not actually their hit points. It's not their health. It's just their ability to continue going on adventures. And then you will also have a kind of narrative skill and a narrative style that can help you on your adventure. When I got the new game and I saw the new character sheet, I was a little taken aback by how simplified it had become because we have no stats at all anymore. We have a character name, a career, their knacks, a quest, and gumption, and then a catchphrase, and maybe some gear and loot, and a picture of the character. And so a lot of this kind of crunch here was completely stripped out of the new version. And the designer went for a very, very simplified design. And at first, I was a little disappointed with that, uh, with that move. And for me, for I was going to play this new version actually using the rules from the old version. And you can totally do that. So if you want a little more crunch, you can add it to the new version. You could also even use a lot of the stuff in this new book as a supplement for a completely different uh, system if you want. It, it, it's kind of system agnostic. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about that as the video goes. But over time, 
I began to become less disappointed and I started to embrace this new version for what it is, not what it isn't. And I think I've grown fond of this super, super simplified uh, version of Space Aces. And that is really because of all of the other stuff that this book adds to the game. And this book taken in conjunction with this book, I think form a really, really strong foundation upon which you can build a super interesting and evocative and fun kind of science fiction solo RPG uh, game. And so I still use some of the stuff from the original, the new guidebook. And that is basically a lot of the charts that you can use to roll up random things. So I will use those just as additional tables for Space Aces Voyages in Infinite Space. But let's take a detailed look here now at Space Aces Voyages in Infinite Space. So here we have our table of contents. All of the rules are less than 11 pages. It's about seven pages of rules. And the rest of the book is just overflowing with things for you or your characters, or if you're playing with a GM, your players, uh, just things to discover in this vast, vast galaxy of adventure. And it, this has got to be one of the greatest kind of sci-fi source books for this kind of role playing. And it is very, very inspiring and you will have a lot of fun and a lot of adventure. So the core rules are you roll a d20 and a d6 anytime you do something that is risky, dangerous, or uncertain. And um, the GM or the player will assign a difficulty to that. That can be anything from easy, which is five, up through 20, which is epic. And then depending on the situation, depending on if your character has a skill that might help or maybe a background or they've learned something, that difficulty can go up or down. Usually it's going to go down because the character knows something. So something might start off as a hard difficulty of a 15. And because your character knows something about what's going on, you might bump it down to a 10. And that is kind of up to you as the player if you are playing solo. But you will roll a D20 and a D6, and you will try to hit or beat, meet or beat that target number. And that's it. And the D6 is called your effect D6. And this will add snags and benefits to whatever happens with that D20. So a snag is something that even if you overcome the challenge, a snag is something bad happening. Happening, It's a negative side effect, a consequence. And usually what will happen is you will raise the heat level up by one. And so this game uses the heat level from the original. And I really do like this system here. But the heat level goes from one to 20. And depending on how high the heat level is, the impact of a negative outcome becomes stronger. It's 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 in a direct relationship to how high the heat level is. So at a heat level of one, if something bad happens to the characters, it's more it's what do they call that? They call that a minor annoyance is from heat levels one to five. But when you get up to 16 or 20, it's called an oh no and stuff starts exploding. So as the heat level raises during a mission, during a gig, because this game is all about living in this futuristic gig economy, your characters are space aces and they just take all kinds of random jobs, just trying to survive, trying to make ends meet, trying to make a name for themselves in this galactic uh, world of adventure. But as the heat level rises on your quest, on your missions, then more bad things will start to happen. It kind of and it kind of forces you to snowball the, uh, the, the the dramatic tension of the game. And I think that is really, really cool. So on a roll of a one to two on the effect die on the D6, you will raise the heat level and then something bad might happen. But if you roll a five or six on the effect die, that is a benefit. And so something good might happen even if you do fail your check. And that's basically it. There are no numbers that you add to your D20. You're not adding any stats because you don't have any stats to add. You're just modifying the difficulty level depending on the situation at hand, depending on if the characters are prepared or not prepared. 
and then you're kind of balancing that off with the heat level. Creating a character is as simple as rolling uh, on four different uh, four different charts. We have character career, character knack, your space towel, and your character quest. That's all you do to create a character. And we are actually going to create three characters in an example uh, a little later in this video. So when it comes to conflict, this game calls conflict scuffles, and you get into scuffles. Scuffles can be uh, laser battles, they can be fisticuffs, they could be uh, breakdancing competitions, <laughs> they can be anything. Anytime there is conflict in the game, you follow these rules for scuffles. And the first thing you do is you determine the stakes. You determine how, how's it looking for the players. Are they in a tight spot? Are they evenly matched or do they have the high ground with uh, their competitors? If they're in a tight spot, you roll 2d6 and you take the lowest. If they're evenly matched, you roll 1d6 and read the result. If they have the high ground, you will roll 2d6 and take the highest result. And then you will look at the situation table here. So let's say my characters were... Uh, they were uh, walking down this weird path on this planet that they had never been to before. And they were in a weird kind of alien forest. And some alien natives jumped out to accost them or to, to question them to see why, why are you here? Why, why have you trespassed on our planet? So for this particular scuffle, I would first ask, how's it looking? What's, it, uh, what's the situation for my characters? And I think this would be I'm in a tight spot because I'm completely out of my element. I am a fish completely out of uh, out of the water that I'm used to. So I will roll 2d6 and then take the lowest result. And hey, a double five. So the lowest result is five. That's pretty good. On a five, to, uh, on a five or a six, we are in the clear. The characters have the upper hand and may take the... This says attack an opponent, but it doesn't have to be an attack. We have the upper hand, so we are able to... To come to terms with this conflict, uh, yeah, we, we can take control of this conflict. And so we might say that now, well, this, uh, this is a negotiation tactic or something. We need to talk our way out of it. We don't want to attack these creatures because we don't know if they're good or bad or not. And they haven't attacked us. So we have the upper hand. So we might say this is some kind of negotiation tactic on a tricky, on a 10 or higher. And then let's say one of my characters has a knack of, of, of negotiating with aliens. And so we could bump this actually down to easy. And so I kind of know what I'm doing since I have the upper hand and I have the skill for it. So I would roll and I got a six. <laughs> okay, very lucky I knocked that down. So I overcome the challenge and I rolled a six, which is a benefit. And so maybe I have convinced these, uh, these creatures that I mean them no harm and they, they, they believe me. And so they've taken me back to their city and they're treating me with respect or they're not treating me as a hostile. So that's basically how a scuffle will work. And that works with combat or any kind of conflict. We also have a really handy chart here for very, very quickly creating um, opponents. And we can roll to see what their strength is and roll to see what their difficulty is for when we are fighting them. And uh, when you are in a physical battle or in kind of maybe a battle of wills or a battle of words, and depending on who wins, the other side will lose points of their gumption. And that's basically the only stat. And once gumption gets to zero, your opponent gets to do with you what they will. And so that kind of forces a story moment there for the GM or for the player to take charge of the story and narrate what the opponent is going to do with uh, in victory. So very, very, uh, very easy and pretty interesting. And I think it keeps the focus on narrative play. And all of these rules really do focus on narrative play. And for another really good example of that is the delving. Now, delving is what happens when you are going on on an adventure, when you are uh, crawling through a space ruin, when you are looking through a space hulk. Uh, delving is an easy to run mini game that utilizes a simple push your luck mechanic to streamline complex tasks. And as examples, 
You might be salvaging space wrecks, exploring star ruins, infiltrating corporate bases, mining hypercrystals, or escaping a high security prison. You will always do that with a Delve. And this is a really cool little system, a great little pressure luck system. And so at the, each Delve will have a number of levels that you have to navigate. And usually those will be three to five levels. And a Delve might also have some hazards. And depending on how you navigate those different levels, you will have to face off against various hazards. At the beginning of each Delve turn, one of the PCs, one of the player characters will be the leader, and they will do what is called a wayfinding roll. And a wayfinding roll is a pressure luck system where you are trying to roll a six in total. But if you bust, if you roll a seven or higher, then something really bad happens. And so interpreting the results on a wayfinding roll on a one, two, or three, you make no progression, you lose a supply, and the leader, the person making the roll, takes one harm, so they would lose a point of gumption. Now, supply is kind of a, it's a, a an abstract amount of the things that your crew might need to overcome this delve. And so most of the time, your crew will start a delve with two, uh, two supply. If they are very prepared, they will have a three supply, or if they are extremely prepared, they will have four supply. So as you lose supply, if you go down to zero supply, you fail the delve. But if you roll a four to a five, then you make it to a level, you make it to the next level, but you lose a point of supply, but the coast is clear. If you roll a six, then you automatically go down one level, you progress one level, and the coast is clear, so you've made it safely. If you roll a seven or higher, you lose a supply you and you have to face a hazard before you can progress to the next level. Really, really cool system. I love this. And so if um, I was going down, let's, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to create the delve now, but I'll show you how, the, how it works. So if I was making the Wayfinder roll, my character would roll a D6 and hey, I rolled a six right off the bat. Okay, woohoo, plus one level and the coast is clear. So I don't have to face a hazard. I don't lose the supply. I just go to the next level. And let's say now I'm in level, uh, the, the, the second level here, and I roll the five. Okay, so a five is a uh, plus one level, but you lose one supply and the coast is clear. Now I could press my luck and try to roll a one. And if I rolled a one, then I would hit a six and I would go up a level, but I wouldn't lose any supply. I will just lose supply. Let's say I had two supply here. We'll keep this. So now I go down to one supply and now I'm on the next level and I roll a five. Okay, I will go down uh, to the, the to let's say the final level of this delve, but now I have no supplies left. Okay, and I hit a two. Okay, so a two, zero levels and you lose a supply and I lose a harm. Well, I can't do that. If I take that, uh, if I take that result, uh, we are out. We have lost this delve because we have no supply. So I need to get that six. So I need to roll a four now. I can press my luck. Okay, so there's a five. I still don't have one supply. I need to roll a one and no, a four, I busted. I got seven or higher. And so I lose a supply and I have to face a hazard. And now I have to escape that delve because I have no more supply and I can't get that, uh, that sweet bonus for overcoming the delve. Really, really cool system. And that system also translates to navigating uh, the, to hypersurfing, they call it, to navigating the stars, to piloting throughout the various star systems. And the star systems are actually here, found here in this galaxy in a box, which comes with a whole bunch of tiles. So we have tiles that represent all of the star systems. And each one of these star systems has a page or two or three dedicated to it in the book that details all kinds of super cool things that you might find in that star system. You might find delves. You might find random charts about what's happening on the planets. You might find detailed little submissions to go on. You might find different kinds of creatures to interact with, all kinds of different things. And every single one of these cards in this galaxy in a box has a detailed description of adventures and all kinds of really cool things that you can find while you are playing the game. 
And then there are also these uh, blank uh, spaces here, these blank star sectors, and these represent deep space. And when you are in deep space and you have an encounter, you have to roll up this on this really cool deep space encounter table that has all kinds of different tables and subtables of things that you might have to encounter in deep space. And piloting a uh, hyper surfing traveling through the galaxy through the star sectors that utilizes that same pressure luck system where you are trying to hit a six if you hit a seven over you go bust and your ship takes damage but the character will make a make basically a piloting skill and so depending on what you roll if you roll a one two or three it's a bumpy ride and your your your, uh, your uh, ship takes shield damage and you have an encounter on a four to a five, something happens. Uh, you have something on the sensors. You have an encounter. If you hit that perfect six, the coast is clear. You have you've uh, had a safe travel. If you hit that seven, you take one whole damage, and you also have an encounter. And there are basically three types of ships that you can create in this game. We have small ships, medium ships, and large ships. The small ships will have two shields, two hull, and two drive range. That means they can travel two hexes. And each hex takes about 24 hours to travel. And then med our large ships will have four shields, four hull, and they have a drive range of four. And then your ship will also have a purpose and a personality. And again, those are kind of narrative prompts that will help you determine certain things about your ship when you need something mechanical. And then there are also starship scuffles, which basically play out the same way as the normal scuffles, but damage is a little more detailed because the damage might be done to certain stations on your ship or certain systems. So we have the helm system, the engineering, operations and tactical and each one of those things provides a little bit of a narrative uh, that that drives the mechanism for when you're trying to determine certain things with your ship and then the next page of rules we have some oracles and i think these are pretty cool we have exploring more stuff so if you are out exploring the world and you need a little bit more detail you can roll up here and maybe you've found uh, some kind of archive it's holding knowledge and that was not the D20, uh, two and 18. And it's an infamous, so an infamous place holding knowledge. Uh, maybe if you're meeting new people here, you find somebody who's curious and they are a healer. So they have the restore ability. So we have these two handy little charts here. And then we have this situation dice. And this is a really, really cool table with sub tables that just uh, will create uh, random things that you might have to overcome, random situations. And so if you were here to roll 11 and five, some kind of helpful resource. All right, so maybe you've stumbled across something that might help you on your journey. Or 18.6, we are being hailed. Hands up, do as I say, nobody gets hurt. So we've been hailed by some space pirates or something like that. And you want to interpret these based on your heat level. And so as your heat is going up, the good or the bad effects of this situation dice get better or worse. So really, really cool. And then it shows you how to, how to generate missions. This is one place where I think the original book has uh, more value for the solo player because of the mission and episode generating tables. And so this is where I would turn to the old guide book to generate my missions. And then we also have a very, very simple little D6 Oracle for your yes and no questions. And then we get into the character creation and then the almost the rest of the book here is all about the different things that you will find while you are exploring the vast galaxy and the galaxy in a box here. And there's a popular saying when it comes to these kinds of newer RPGs and uh, something that a lot of people encourage people to keep in mind. And that is uh, to, to play to discover what happens. And don't worry so much about coming up with, 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 with stories before you play. Play to discover the story. Play to discover what happens. And I think this book does a really, really good job 
it encourages that kind of play better than or as good or better than any other game I can think of. Now, one thing that I have thought about as a kind of house rule, and that is for gear for using a usage die. So most of the time your character will just have the gear that they need and that's fine. But I like to play with the usage die system. And I also came up with this system to kind of simulate wealth in space. How wealthy is your character? And that is based upon the usage die that they have for their gear and loot. And because there is no money here, I think this also helps to when your characters want to buy things or when they need to do some kind of financial negotiation. Uh, maybe they need to, maybe their ship has been damaged and they they need to haggle with the space mechanic to, to figure out how much it's going to cost them. And then I would turn to this little usage die system here. So uh, the usage die goes from a D4 up to a D20. And for those of you who maybe are new to games and you don't know what a usage die is, a usage die is a system of abstracting uh, tools, abstracting materials that your character might need while they were on an adventure. And so um, anything they might need, if I had a usage die of 12, I could say, okay, I'm going to uh, reach into my bag and pull out this uh, hyper sensor that will allow me to bypass this force field. Okay, do I have that or not? I would roll my D12. And if I rolled a one or a two, I go down in a, in a usage die. So I, I have the thing I'm looking for, but the next time I search, it's going to be a little harder to find. And so I would uh, take this. So a D12 would go down to a D8. And so now my usage die is at D8. I've spent some tools. I've spent some of my resources using the things that I brought. And so this can go all the way down to a D4. And then on a D4, usually it's a roll of a one. Then you no longer have any resources. You're flat broke or something like that. There's a, a few different ways to use a usage die, but they are almost always used to abstract supplies. But I figured that a D4 would be down and out and a D20 if somebody has a usage die of a D20, that would be something like a successful business, a corporation, a government agency. A D6 might be a typical space adventurer. A D8 might be a successful adventurer. A D10 would be an adventuring mogul. A D12 would be a successful businessman or a space kind of real estate agent or something like that. And so you could also use this system here for kind of comparative roles. So if I was a typical space adventurer, I have a D6 and I was trying to negotiate something and maybe I was trying to, to pull a fast one, to pull a con on a successful business, then I could take my D6 and my D20 because this represents my wealth. And then this represents the relative wealth of the corporation I'm trying to scam. And whoever rolls the highest uh, wins that roll. I don't know, just something like that. I think that's kind of a cool little system. And so I'm still kind of tinkering with that, but I did want to mention that just in case somebody wants to take that and kind of uh, kind of run with it if they're going to be playing uh, Space Aces here. But let's, uh, let's roll up a couple of characters. So I'm going to roll up a main character and then two crew members, and I'll also roll up a spaceship for us. Okay, so my character's name. Uh, let's let's just take my my old character from my first games of Space Aces, and we'll say Sam Foyle. Okay, so this is maybe a new version of Sam Foyle in some kind of alternate universe. So let's see what his uh, career is. And a two and a 20, so 220, an interstellar lifeguard. Okay, so let's see, interstellar lifeguard. I'm some kind of protector. I don't think I'm going to interpret lifeguard as, as uh, somebody who works at the space YMCA, uh, but maybe I am, I, uh, I, I've traveled the, throughout the, the, the solar system. I've traveled throughout the galaxy uh, helping people. So interstellar lifeguard. All right, so my knacks. So my character gets one knack. So let's roll for my knack. As you level up in the game, you get more knacks. You get more skills. And the way that works is if you ever roll a 20, if you ever roll a natural 20 on a check, you learn something about what you are doing. And so you can write a new skill as a new knack. 
All right, so five, five. So we're here, five, five. Lightning fast reflexes. Hey, that works for the kind of lifeguard, the kind of lifesaver I am. So all right, lightning fast reflexes. Okay, let's see what my character's quest is. What is Sam Foyle trying to do? Uh, nine and a two, so two, nine. Uh, find my true identity. Okay, so I'm trying to find my true identity. So while you are playing, if you ever make progress towards your personal quest, you gain a point of gumption. Um, after 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 a, a play after a session. So during a session, during a mission, during a quest, if you make any kind of progress towards your personal quest then you gain gumption. So that uh, kind of simulates your character getting stronger, but it also simulates your character just learning more about themselves and becoming more comfortable of uh, being an adventurer. And so they, they have more gumption. They have a, more of a will, more of a drive to go on. And now let's see what my uh, space towel is here. Now I just realized that we don't really have a... a, a uh, a space for space towel. So I will put that in my gear and loot here. And what is my space towel made out of? Six, it's extra plush pibble fur. Okay, so I'll write plush pibble fur. And six, it features a lie detecting lattice. Okay, lie detecting, nice. So maybe while I am questing for my true identity, I'm trying to find something about myself, maybe my past. Uh, maybe maybe I was adopted and I'm trying to find my, my, my true parents or something like that. You know, as I am questioning people, I do have my lie detecting towel with me. So that can help me uh, to, to find out my personal quest. I think that's pretty cool. All right. So that is Sam Foyle. And uh, all new characters start with a maximum of three gumption. And I'll have to come up with some kind of catchphrase there. Uh, let's come up with a ship too. So I wanted my ship to be called the Starbird. And it is a small ship. So I can have, I think a crew of three, I would say on a small ship. Let's roll up my ship's original purpose is a three. It was uh, for transportation. Okay, so purpose was for transportation. Transport and an 11, my personality. It's a glass cannon. It's overpowered, but very fragile. So glass cannon. So I bought this old transport ship and I've kind of modified it into some kind of small starfighter and it is a glass cannon. So it has a shield of two. It has a hole of two and a maximum maximum drive range of two. Now upgrades and ship layout, there aren't really any rules. Those are all uh, narrative focused. And so as players, if you want to come up with new things that you can upgrade your ship with or kind of a ship layout, then you need to come up with some kind of way to work those into the rules that are present. And they, were, they will all be things that help you drive the narrative. So real quickly, let's come up with a couple of my character, uh, my, my crew, my two man crew. And I will uh, do this off camera and then I will tell you the results. Okay, so here we have my two man crew. So my main character here is Sam Foyle. My small starship is called the Starbird. And then we have uh, Seven Stark Seven here. He is a mysterious space hermit. His knacks is uh, space smarts. And his quest is to finish his space doctorate. And then we also have my other character here, my, my other crew person, and that her name is Stella Sammy. And she is a questing knight errant. She has a knack of street magic, so she's good with sleight of hand. And her quest is to overcome her fears. I don't know what her fears are, so maybe we have to discover what her fears are before uh, she can even start to overcome them. And so there are a couple of ways that you can start playing Space Aces. One of the ways is you can always start here in the system of Lanai. So let's take a look at the system of Lanai here, and this will give you a good example 
of uh, what you can expect here. So we have the system of Lanai. And at the system of Lanai, we have Starbase 42. And that is kind of the headquarters, the galactic hub for the space aces for this intergalactic gig economy. And so the uh, space aces will hang out at Starbase 42 and they will take on missions. And so Starbase 42 is usually and when you are playing will be at the center of your galaxy. And on Starbase 42, you might uh, roll up on what's happening right now. So let's say our characters are here at Starbase 42 and we're hanging out. We're waiting to take some kind of job. And uh, let's see what's happening right now on Starbase 42. A 16, an eccentric bajillionaire has reportedly hidden a treasure somewhere on the star base and now treasure hunters are tearing the place up trying to find it interesting so this says go to page 115 i'm not sure what's going on on page 115 here let's take a look at page 115 so this is space treasure okay let's uh see what has been hidden on on the uh, star base 42. I should have had a piece of paper here to keep us to do some writing with let me try to find a uh a notepad real quick. So this isn't necessarily a journaling game, but it always helps when you're playing a solo RPG to keep track of things so you can remember what's going on. So this is day one and we are on Starbase 42. And an eccentric bajillionaire, bajillion, has hidden a treasure. And it's kind of all hands on deck. All these space aces are trying to find this treasure. Uh, maybe that's just an easy way to make some money. So they don't have to do some crazy kind of uh, fetch quest in the gig economy. So let's figure out what kind of treasure this bajillionaire hid on the on Starbase 42. Uh, 217. Okay, uh, Stardis Doorways. A pair of quantum entwined blue doors of standard size that allow instant passage between them regardless of distance. Interesting. So basically a portal. So he, this eccentric bajillionaire, they have hidden the Stardis doorways. Stardis doorways. Now everybody is on this treasure hunt to find them. Maybe, maybe what could be interesting is maybe this bajillionaire hid one of the doorways and that doorway, the other one, he put on, let's find a system here. He put on the Rookbat system and he is, this is going to be kind of a space scavenger hunt. And so this bajillionaire has said, okay, the first person to find the doorway on, on, on Starbase 42 can go through the doorway and the next clue for this scavenger hunt will be on Rookbat. And so we might have to go to that planet. Okay, so that's kind of cool. So I will say that uh, this is a Delph and this will be a five level Delph. So a five level Delph. And we need to, we have, uh, we have two, uh, two supplies. So we need to overcome this five level delve with with only two supplies to be the first people to find this door. And so this would just be a really quick game of press my luck. And uh, Sam Foyle here, he's the one going on the treasure hunt. Uh, seven Stark Seven, his two uh, crew people, uh, Seven Stark Seven and Stella Sammy, they are getting the starbird ready just in case we need it. And they're working on that. So Sam Foyle is on this treasure hunt and he has lightning fast reflexes. And I think I think his lightning fast reflexes would actually come in handy here because this is kind of a race. This is a, a, a pressure luck against time thing because we are competing with other space aces trying to find this treasure. So I'm going to give uh, Sam or I'm going to give uh, Sam Foyle here uh, three supplies. OK, so I need to come up also with a with hazards. 
If I fail, we'll have to come up with hazards on the fly. Of uh, We'll probably have to fight against other space aces who are trying to sabotage uh, Sam Foyle's ability to find this treasure. Okay, so I'm going to start by rolling my d6, take my wayfinding roll, and I roll a four. Okay, plus one level, but minus one supply, and the coast is clear. Okay, I will take that. So I drop down to two supplies, and now I'm on the fourth level. Okay, so we're making progress towards finding this treasure. And a six, excellent. Okay, we make it down, we make it to level three. We don't lose any supplies. Okay, my next wayfinding roll here, a five. I will take that. So I will go down to one supply, and now I'm, I'm, I'm at level two there. We're making our way through this delve. And a two, a two is a zero levels, minus one supply, and the leader takes harm. I'm going to press my luck and try to roll higher. A two, a three, a five. Okay, plus one level. So I'm down to level one and I have zero supplies. Okay, so this is this is uh, really, really dramatic here. I'm almost ready to find this treasure, but I have to pass this. I have zero supplies. So if I fail this, I fail the delve. And a three. Okay, no, I don't want that. I need to get a six. A five, no. Okay, so I lost. Well, I, I guess I can try to get a one. Yep. Three, four, five. Yeah, if I roll a one, I find the treasure. A five. No, I bust. Okay, so I lose that delve. I was not the first space ace to find uh, that treasure. So somebody found it before and they took off to Rookbat and they're able to progress the scavenger hunt. Now, we could take this, we could run with this and have this be something in the background, something that is happening on Rookbat. And maybe this has prompted, maybe this has piqued our curiosity. And so we want to find out what happens. We want to follow along with this uh, journey, with this uh, space, <laughs> space aces, with his or their uh, journey to Rookbat to figure out what this scavenger hunt is all about. Maybe we can uh, ride along on their coattails or discover things along the way. So let's, uh, let's take a journey. So Seven Stark Seven and Estella Sammy, they have gotten the Starbird all ready for uh for transport and so we are going to take off and i'm going to roll a d4 to see how much deep space is in between lanai and rootbat and three okay so we'll take three tiles here one two one two three so we're three spaces of deep space away from rootbat and so now we need to travel from Lanai to Rukbat in order to, to find out what's going on with this scavenger hunt. We can't really participate in there, but hey, uh, maybe the maybe the space ace who won that 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 treasure hunt, uh, maybe they'll come across some kind of deadly uh, virus or something, and they might get wiped out, and we can uh, we can take up the quest for them or something like that. So this has really made Sam Foyle. Uh, Sam Foyle is really interested in this and so is uh so is uh, stella sammy because she is a questing knight errant and so any kind of um any kind of adventure with mystery in it she is all about that so let's uh let's go ahead and take off so my ship has a drive range of two so that means i can travel two hexes and then at the end of two hexes i have to do i have to do a little press your luck mini game to figure out how my travel went so uh, we're looking for a six. And so Sam Foyle is at uh, the uh, is at the helm and seven Stark seven is um, engineering, we'll say. And Stella Sammy is in tactical. So in case we have any kind of uh, any kind of combat, Stella Sammy will be taking will be manning the guns on our little starboard glass cannon here. Okay, so Sam Foyle is going to be uh, doing the, the hyper surfing roll and a four. So a four is something on sensors. We would have an encounter in deep space. I can press my luck to try to roll a one or a two for smooth sailing, but I think I will have uh, this encounter. Now we are not in deep space. We are still in the sector of Lanai, actually. So let's see, does Lanai have a sensors? No, that's Lumina. Where's Lanai? So Lanai does not really have anything. Lanai is kind of a populated star sector. So there aren't really um, a, a random encounters. 
things aren't really dangerous in the sector of Lanai because it's so populated. But maybe we have some kind of advertisement flies by. We have a hollow, a hollow advert uh, kind of ship flies by, and let's see what they're advertising here. They are advertising Gary Nine's Genomod Clinic. Before you ask, yes, we can put cat ears and a tail on just about anything. Okay, so we see that kind of a floating space billboard fly by as we are progressing to the planet of Rukbat. Okay, so uh, that took uh, two days there. It's full of travel, so we'll go two more. One, two. Okay, so let's do our little uh, mini game here. A one, okay, so we'll keep going. A six, ooh, a seven, we wiped out. So our hole takes one damage and we have an encounter. So our hole goes down to one. Shields will regenerate in between encounters. Your hole will not. And now we are in deep space. So now we have a deep space encounter. And uh, let's go to our deep space encounter tables here. All right. And let's see what happens in deep space here. We have a 412. A minor encounter. Actually, uh, 12. D21. first. Uh, D20 is star pirates. Uh-oh. And a 4. And we need another D6. We have a 4-2. Okay, 4. A medium pirate corvette and a small cutter armed with holographic camouflage. Ooh, this is not good. Okay, so we have two ships. They are camouflaged. And uh, do we have anybody at the operations? We don't have anybody at the operations station for scanning, targeting, and hacking. So I don't even think we would have an opportunity to detect these star pirates. So they come out, they surround our ship, and they demand uh, they demand payment for us to, to, to pass. Now here's where I would use uh, my usage die. So right now my usage die is at a D6. That is a typical um, space adventurer. I'm not carrying any kind of treasure. I am, however, I am, however carrying the knowledge of this space scavenger hunt. So I'm going to try to convince the pirates that there is a scavenger hunt going on by this famous space bajillionaire, and they have hidden a clue on Rookbat. And there are other space aces en route to Rookbat right now trying to find that clue. And Hey, if those space pirates can get there first, they might be able to intercept that information and they might be able to get the uh, to get that that clue and find the treasure that the bajillionaire has hidden. So that's kind of cool. I like that. I like connecting those two dots there. So I would say that I need to do some kind of check, some kind of uh, check for them to believe me. And let's see, finding my knack, lightning, fast reflexes, street magic, or space smarts. So space smarts. I'm going to say that uh, this is going to start off at epic. Very hard to, to uh, communicate with space pirates. Very hard to convince them that there might be something worthwhile when they have uh, this, this, easy, th this easy job right here. They could easily take uh, my, my earnings right now. But um, we'll start that at an epic of 20. And I will ask off, uh, I, I've shut off my communications and I'm asking Seven Stark Seven for some advice because he has space smarts. And I think that would drop that down to 15 to a hard. And so this would be kind of a negotiation scuffle. So let's see if I'm able to convince the space pirates about this space scavenger hunt. Oh, I thought that was going to hit 17, and no, that was so close. Okay, so a 10 and a 1, so this is really bad. So my heat level has gone up 1. I need a little heat level tracker, but my heat level, we'll take that over here. So a uh, heat here. Heat starts at 1, and I am now up to level 2 heat, and I fail the roll. So they they take that information. They might go there but they also want, they also demand payment. And so I would have to, I think, knock down Sam Foyle's usage die. So he has transferred some credits to them. And so Sam Foyle is going to go down to D4 on his usage die for any gear. So, all right. 
So that was the encounter with the space pirates. And let's uh, let's continue on to Rookbat here. Okay, let's see how our hyper surfing goes. Uh, three and a four, seven. No, I wipe out. I take another point of hull damage. So I have, uh, my ship is not doing good right now. I need to do some repairs, but there's probably not anything here in this empty sector to repair. I really need to make it to Rookbat. So hopefully I don't take any more damage. And now let's see, we do have this uh, deep space encounter again. So hopefully, uh, hopefully it's not something super bad, but let's see what happens here. Okay, a four, a 12 and a four. Stu oh my gosh, space pirates again, exactly the same. Uh <laughs> So these space pirates, they follow me. Uh, they know that I am a sucker and my ship is doing really bad. And um, I am going to have to knock down one of my usage dies again to pay them. So this time Stella Sammy will go down to a D4 on her usage die. So now uh, I think these space pirates are just probably going to follow me all the way to, to <laughs> all the way to Rookbat here. Okay, let's go another two here. We're still in deep space. Uh, we are not doing very good on our uh, on our hyper surfing. A six. All right, finally we're safe. Smooth sailing. The coast is clear. Okay, let's do one. Uh, do it again. One, two. Okay, now we are in the Rook Bat system. So now we can turn here to the uh, Rook Bat system. The Rook Bat sector is highly hazardous to navigate with metallic titano spiderweb traps floating freely through space. Getting caught in one would result in a very sticky situation at best and attract the attention of an energy sucking titano spider at worst. The central planet of New Drek appears to be skewered by a gigantic sword and is orbited by the nest-like moon called Webb. Oh, interesting. Okay, so there is a detailed adventure in this sector called Arachnothankyphobia. There are, it looks like somehow we can find some legendary blades here. And we also have a what's happening here when we land on New Drek. And we do have a sensors detect. So if we have an encounter, we will have to roll on that rather than the deep space encounters. So let's see how our, um, when we land here, we have a six again. Okay, so we're good. So should we land on, yeah, we need to land on Rookbat because we need to try to track down, but that that um, other space ace, they came here immediately through that portal door. So we need to see if we can track down any kind of clues that they might have left. So we will go one, two and land on Rookbat, but let's see how that travel went three and a four, seven, no. Okay, so we have crashed on Rookbat because our hole is at zero. And now we are we have crash landed on Rookbat. And in doing so, we do have some kind of encounter as we are plummeting to the ground here. Four, a pack of energy eating Titano spiders from web sailing through space on silken solar sails. They appear to be heading toward a web trap that has just caught a pod of scared stellar dolphins. Okay, so we see that as we are plummeting to root bat. Uh, Sam, uh, Sam Foil is holding onto the helm and he's able to bring it into a semi-soft landing on New Drek. And so we do need to spend some time on New Drek to, to repair our ship. And uh, let's see what's happening on, on uh, New Drek right now, 14. It's a joust. It's the annual aerial jousting tournament. Well-armored Drekian knights collide dramatically in mid-air above cheering crowds. An ancient rule states that a knight is allowed one rider to hold the lance. Hey, Stella Sammy is a questing knight errant, right? Maybe uh, we need to win this jousting championship so we can earn enough money to fix the starboard and we can continue on our quest. Who knows? And that is uh, plain to find out what happens in Space Aces. So yeah, this book is fantastic. And this game is really, really good. If you're picking this up and you're reading the rules and you're thinking that it's a little too light, I would encourage you to take the time to, to kind of just accept it for what it is. 
because it always does seem to generate fun and interesting adventures, as you just saw. I mean, we had all kinds of cool things happen here, and we have enough stuff for maybe two more hours of adventure. But after the uh, after all of the star sectors, you have so many different star sectors with so many charts and adventures and delves and combat and weird creatures to face. But then we also get into the next section here, which is, God, there's so many, there's so much stuff here. We have space loot. And so we have six D20 tables for all kinds of space loot, space treasure we've already rolled on. Here we have starship bling. So upgrading a starship and generating a shipyard of things to find. So a D, uh, D6 tables of D20, so D20 sub tables, six of those for upgrading your ship. And then here we have a D20 roll for a wandering space captain because you'll uh, you'll encounter a lot of different space captains. And a lot of these captains come from different planets. So if you were to come across this Captain Pappy um, Aris Turtle, he is a species of turtle, and the turtles are found on page 74. And so you could turn to page 74 to learn more about the turtles. And just super cool. I love this so much. We've taken a look at the deep space encounters there. So all kinds of deep space encounters. Here we have a D20 table for random missions. So if you just want to go on random missions from Starbase 42 and head out, you can roll on one of these missions. And then here we have a few uh, more tables for, these are called the back pages. We have player character species, rules for fast travel, and so on. And then a, a full kind of adventure, and then also to determine a random location there. But this book here is fantastic. I love this. And coupled with this, if you need even more random things to roll up, you can always couple it with your Space Aces new guidebook. These two things together just create so much adventure and so much fun. And if you want a little more crunch, you can use the rules here to play this, or you can use any rules that you want to play Space Aces. And if you're looking for even more uh, random things to discover in space, I also wanted to highlight Star Dogs, the referee's handbook. And so this is a supplement that was mentioned by Alan in one of the uh, Alone Together episodes that I did with Alan from Perplexing Ruins. And Star Dogs here is designed and written by Michael Raston. And this is just a bunch of random charts for things that you might find in space. And if you're looking for any kind of random space thing, this book will probably have a way to randomly generate it. So these three things taken together, man, you have like almost an infinite amount of space uh, adventure. Voyages in infinite space. Yes, I would agree with that. So, all right, you guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this very detailed look at Space Aces. If you are enjoying it, let me know about the kinds of adventures that you've been having. And we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.